Well, welcome everyone to this conversation. Um, we're delighted to have guests with us today, uh, Professor Minaz Afridi, who is a professor of religion and the director of the Holocaust, Genocide and Interfaith Education Center at Manhattan College. And she is actually just back from presenting at the National Cathedral in Washington, DC for the unveiling of Elie Wiesel's stone carving, um, which I know is a real honor for her to be part of that and also Professor Ivan Kalmar, a professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto. Um, and his research has addressed a wide range of topics, um, including uh, his interest in, in how Jews and Muslims have been portrayed in similar ways in Western Christian cultural history. Um, and today we'll be having a conversation between them and, and with all of you, hopefully. And so we invite you to write your comments and your questions in that Q&A field. Whenever they occur to you, you don't have to wait till the end of the program, although we'll be turning to those comments and questions after we hear from both of them. Um, and now I think my colleague, Professor Soares will, will be speaking. So, um, yeah, I, so am I supposed to introduce you, Rachel? Um, well, I can introduce myself. Thank you. Uh, um, for, for, I, I'm, I teach in the Department of Religion and the Center for Jewish Studies, um, where I am the, the Bud Shorsting Fellow in American Jewish Culture. And it's such a pleasure to be hosting another of these events with my colleague, Professor Ben Suarez. Yeah, so thank you, Rachel. And I'm Benjamin Suarez from the Department of Religion and the Center for Global Islamic Studies. And this is the second event that Rachel Gordon and I have organized together uh, in which we are talking about Islam and Judaism, Jews and Muslims together, something that we think is very important. And now Rachel will introduce our speakers. Oh, well, I, I, I think we just covered um, most of, of uh, their background, but if um, Ivan or Manaz, if there's anything else you'd like to share, please feel free. Otherwise, I think we'll get to turn to Manaz now. Thank you so much. Yeah, no need to go through an introduction by, I'm, I, you know, it's just, um, but I, I just wanted to say that, um, First of all, I'm doing the National Cathedral after this. So it's tonight at seven o'clock. So you can register and actually watch it. Um, but I, I really want to thank Rachel Gordon and Benjamin Soares and also Ivan Kalmar and um, Norman uh, Goda, but especially to Jewish Studies, uh, the Center of Jewish Studies and Islamic Global Studies. And I think that's such a wonderful um, union that you have and that you're doing this kind of programming which is incredibly important, um, especially today. So I'm just gonna talk, uh, say a few things about who I am, my work, um, the intersections of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, and perhaps, you know, um, sheds a little bit of light of uh, what goes on in terms of Jewish Muslim relations today in the United States. So my uh, work is both uh, Islam and also the Holocaust. So I teach both these fields in uh, religious studies. So I've, I've created a few courses on religion and Holocaust, uh, genocide and religion, Muslims and Holocaust, which I'm teaching right now. And then I have an array of classes on Islam, Muslims in America, Islamic memory and literature, uh, women in Islam, um, the Quran and the context. So there's a array of things that I do and I wear basically two hats. Um, but as a Muslim, um, being the director of a Holocaust has been challenging to say the least, but it also has been the most interesting journey that I've had um, and the kinds of people that I've met through my work. So my journey with Judaism uh, began uh, a long time ago. I was born in Pakistan, but I was raised in Europe, uh, mainly Western Europe and um, places like Switzerland and London, and then also um, the Middle East. And um, then I came to the United States when I was in my second year of high school. But every year I basically went home, which is Pakistan. And so I'm very connected with 
um, my family who still lives there. So I would just want to give you a little background in terms of how I was raised, because I think multi-dimensional experience and journeys really shape who we are. And so when I was growing up, I was uh, othered by schools and I was hanging out with Jews and Hindus mainly because we were the kind of outcast religious uh, groups that were not really the predominant Christians in the classroom. So this obviously, I you know, identified with, with some Jewish friends. Uh, I was raised Muslim, still am Muslim, still am practicing. And my Jewish and Muslim uh, and our Muslim and Jewish relations in Europe were pretty amicable as kids. Um, and then I moved to the Middle East, which was very hard because there were no Jews. Uh, there were basically Christians and Muslims. And I moved to Dubai. Uh, uh, it's actually a school called Shoifat, which still exists in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So I became curious about this, and I saw a lot of, um, I guess, censorship in textbooks, taking out the word Israel and Jew. So as a child, I became curious. Some were not. They said this is something they did all the time. And then when I moved to Scarsdale, New York, um, there was a lot of pushback against me from the Jewish American community. So you can imagine. Uh, there's just a complete, you know, kind of transformation in terms of identity and who I was, and I could, I just couldn't understand what this was. So a lot of my work is actually from concrete experience, um, <clears throat> but then I decided to study this and to actually, in a very idealistic way, which I still believe I am in some ways, um, to create peace between these two groups. Um, so that's the goal of my center. Basically, we do a lot of programming on peace building between Jews and Muslims and Christians. We are at a Catholic university, which makes it even more unique. So that's sort of a kind of a narrative, sort of a bio of who I am. And the other part that is, was really interested to me is the Holocaust and colonization, uh, which I mentioned in my book, Shoah Through Muslim Eyes and the intersections of that, and what happened to the colonial victim and the victim of the Holocaust, but also the victim of um, Germany and Western Europe. And I look at that in terms of my work. And one of the things that I take from is Franz Fernand, who says that, you know, basically we are trapped in history. Um, even uh, someone like James Baldwin says that history traps us and we trap our own history. And that to me became a very amazing way to look at history and start to think about where were Muslims or Arabs trapped uh, and where were Jews trapped? And so my work, um, in, especially in the book, Show Up Through Muslim Eyes, not only looks at the Holocaust or, and I do interviews with survivors in that book, but also has a chapter on um, the Holocaust and colonialism. Um, so I think that's a big part of my work. It's a big part of how we look at our tangled histories with one another. But it's also an essential part of understanding how we are informed by our histories and what we, we, what we identify with today, specifically in places like North Africa. Um, and also, I look at uh, many, many uh, places in South Asia, including Pakistan, in terms of how the Jew is viewed and how we perceive the Jew as Muslims. The important thing about colonial history, I think in terms of this conversation is really about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. I know that today there are many debates on how to define anti-Semitism. A uh, good colleague of mine, Jonathan Jadakin, wants to say Judeophobia. Um, there are people um, who want to say that it's anti-Judaism. And in my book, I use anti-Semitism and not with a hyphen. So, so Jonathan and I need to talk about this because he believes that it's, it's, it's supposed to be seen as a hyphen. And, but in my book, I don't call Islamophobia Islamophobia. I call it anti-Muslim sentiment. So there's, there's different ways of how we can even have this conversation and how we see anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Because I think there are various, various scholars out there with different arguments. Uh, on many sides in terms of how we define this today. And I think the most important thing is that, um, I, I just wanna quote Saeed, um, who says that I emphasize in it, my orientation accordingly, that neither the term orient, not orientalism, 
um, mostly for the students here, you know, connected to the East, nor the concept of the West, the Stark West, has any ontological stability. Each is made up of human effort, partly affirmation, partly identification of the other. So, um, for example, just for our, um, kind of a pedagog pedagogical point, in my Muslims in Holocaust class, we are talking about race as a concept, that it is not actually real. Uh, and that's a very hard kind of conversation to have today. But I would argue that that's sort of what Saeed is saying in terms of this kind of binary situation that we've created constantly and who falls into which binary at what time and what moments of history. And that definitely changes for Jews and it definitely has changed and is changing for Arabs or Muslims specifically. The other thing I just want to say um, <clears throat> is that what we're dealing with here are very interesting moments of historical identifications of who Jews are and who Muslims are. Um, people will say, well, Jews are Arabs, which they are, um, and Jews are Europeans, which they are, Jews are Eastern European, and we can go on and on, but it's the same thing could be said about Muslims. Um, I just wanna say that because Arabs are not the definitive kind of idea of what a Muslim is. Muslims are predominantly from Asia and Africa. So there's, again, we have this already racialization of who the Muslim is today, Arab. I'm not an Arab, I'm actually Asian. So uh, even my daughter has trouble explaining to people that we are Asian and not Arab, uh, being Muslims. And for Jews, um, the idea of being Arab is also a very, distant kind of association today, especially in the United States. So I think what I want to I want to problematize is that Jews and Muslims were seen in very similar ways at different moments of history. Um, and then there was also, but then what happened post Holocaust changes the landscape of how we see Jews, how we see Israel, um, how we talk about um, the really contestation of what Zionism means and how we talk about colonization and imperialism. And I think we have to problematize these terms in order for us to really learn and open up in terms of these histories. I remember that Disraeli said um, a long time ago that Arabs are just like Jews, but on horseback, right? And this is a comment that was made in 18, I don't know, 70. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, these concepts are, kind of modern concepts, but they have been modernized and then now politicalized, politicalized and also in a cultural, living in a cultural vacuum, uh, so to say today, when we look at social media, when we hear about anti-Semitism, when we hear about, um, you know, Jews and whiteness or Arabs and terrorism and Arabs and oppression and Arabs and human rights. So I want us to really dismantle first, you know, especially for the students here these ideas and terms and fragments that we are left with, but also look at places like North Africa in the 1940s, when you had a kind of relationship with the Arab and the Jew, the Muslim and the Jew, and look at that in terms of racial laws under colonization. I also wanna, uh, I was gonna leave, but I, <laughs> I when it's gone, is talk about, um, Franz Fernand for a minute, where who talked about phobogenic. And he what, he what he wanted to say was that this is, was an anxiety and a fear or resentment, but who also was fascinated and had an envy of the other. And I think that's an important formulation when we're thinking about these terms. So th the one thing I want to say is that when we're thinking about Jewish Muslim relations, or in the larger picture, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, we have to understand how Jews and Arabs or Jews and Muslims have been written into the history of colonization, into the history of literature, into the way that we see it, which we can also compare uh, to black racism today. Um, and black racism today also has been sort of written in. And I'll go back to what, um, um, Said says for Jews, Muslims, and Blacks is that 
there is no ontological reality for this, right? So there is this sort of like mythology, fabrication, and certain politicizations at different moments um, that have gone on. I'm just reading a really interesting book uh, called Dear Palestine about the letters that were written in 1947 to 1949 um, by Palestinian uh, groups and Jewish groups that first were going to go to war with each other um, in, when Israel had drawn the, when UN had drawn the line. It's a fascinating read because you see the propaganda on both sides using the same words that we do today, like Zionism terrorism and using religious tropes when we talk about one another. Um, and I think that that has been sort of left out of the conversation in terms of how we see that. But essentially anti-Semitism and Islamophobia uh, don't originate with one another, but they originate elsewhere, which is basically in the Western and Christian context. And again, Western means along the way also Eastern Europe, uh, we have to include African Christians, we have to include uh, Indian Hindus, we have to include a lot of different pe uh, people. But who controls that narrative and how that narrat narrative gets written is very important. So I'm just going to leave it at that, and I threw out a lot there, but I think I covered the points that I wanted to look at, um, and especially for students today. Thank you. Ivan, it would be great to hear from you. Um, am I speaking now? Okay, so I hope that you can hear me. I'll, I'll explain what my concern is. But first, I'd like to uh, thank Rachel and Benjamin for inviting me. It seems like a really amazing uh, series of talks. I heard a little bit about the courses you're teaching, and they're really what we need uh, in this day and age. And it's so great to be here with uh, Menaz Afridi, whose work is fantastic. And uh, much of what I'm going to say now connects to uh, what she had just said. Uh, right now, I'm in uh, rural France, and my wife and I are the only guests at this remote hotel in the woods. And I'm afraid that the owners have just started watch streaming some movies or something because my connection is getting worse. And I actually was disconnected for a few minutes. So uh, I'm assuming that you can hear me and see me, but if not, then somebody please uh, speak up. What I'm doing here in France is, uh, what I do in other places, I'm interviewing people, and one of the things I'm interested in is uh, anti-Semitism and Islamophobia, or I would put it really a little more generously, how they view Muslims and Jews, because not everybody that we encounter uh, is negative about them. But also, I think uh, if we have, have time, we can talk about how positive views of Jews and Muslims uh, are connected to anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. That sometimes we don't know if views are, are positive or not. So uh, it, what I would like to say about my message here, if you like, as briefly as, as possible, is that, first of all, I want to say, as Menas already did, that the, uh, the way that Western Christians have viewed Jews and Muslims is very intertwined and very similar and has been so for many, many centuries. I've done quite a bit of work on that, but most people are not aware of that. So, um, and the way they've looked at uh, Western Christianity has looked at Jews and Muslims is a form of racism. Okay, we need to realize that, as Mena said, racism is not about something objective, it's very flexible. But perhaps one way that we can look at it is, uh, as the historian Geraldine Heng does, that racism uh, within capitalism is a way to distribute the goods. 
Okay, it's a distributive mechanism. So some people get the privileges, get the, the, the material goods and the more intangible privileges. Uh, but I don't want to oversimplify it, but uh, the, the point is that that functions in capitalism only in such a way that some other people don't have those privileges. And uh, they uh, support through their work uh, the, 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 what we call the core racial, the group that's not racialized, which, you know, white uh, Christians. So there are different kinds of racism, as Menas mentioned, and the kind of racism that Islamophobia and anti-Semitism illustrates is when racism is not really about skin color, which we're most familiar with, but it's about religion. And really, both anti-Semitism and Islamophobia racialize religion. They make out of people who follow a certain religion a race. And uh, they keep certain privileges from those religious groups. So it's, it's uh, racialized racism. So uh, for the longest time, Jews and Muslims, uh, well, longest time, I, I should say, in the 19th century and in the early 20th century, Jews, and, uh, Jews were very aware of this uh, connection be between the way that they were seen and Muslims were seen. Uh, not Muslims so much, because I, I'm talking mainly about the Western world, and at that time there were not that many Muslims in the Western world. But Jews were aware of the imputed connection that they had uh, with Muslims, and they were actually, some of them were quite proud of it. Uh, but, and on the other side, those who hated Jews were also aware of the connection between Jews and Muslims. And that's where we have the notion of the Semite from. And that's why we have anti-Semitism, because Semitic, as you know, is a linguistic family that includes Arabs and uh, Arabic and Hebrew. And 19th century racism racialized also language. Okay, so they felt that uh, Jews, that you could understand Jews through some kind of a genius of the Hebrew language, and likewise, you could understand Islam and Arabs through the characteristics of the Arabic language. I have to say, this kind of thing still survives in some people because uh, when they built Disneyland in Paris, and I was then also in France, they asked my son, who's Jewish, to sing It's a Small World, you know, it's a ride in Disneyland. Uh, I forget the other words, but he was supposed to sing it in Hebrew. Now, he doesn't really know Hebrew, but they felt that it would be more authentic to have a Jewish kid sing It's a Small World in Hebrew than if they chose any other child who doesn't know the language. So there was this idea that through language, the Semitic languages, Arabic and and, and Hebrew, uh, the, the race, the, the, there's a connection also racial between these uh, Semitic peoples. So I, I'll show you a, a quick uh, series of slides uh, that will illustrate visually buildings that Jews built that have a kind of uh, Muslim character uh, because they, they and Christian architects thought that it would be appropriate for them. Uh, but, uh, so Jews were aware of this, but, and in fact, I, I will argue that even a, a, a minority among the Zionists uh, thought and, and said that they were uh, what was then called an Oriental people, so a Middle Eastern people. They didn't belong to Europe, so they belonged, they agreed with the anti-Semites. And so they were going home, not only to Palestine, but they were going home to the Orient, as, as they put it. And as soon as, very soon after they arrived, they, they realized that the Palestinians didn't have the same idea of uh, Semitic kinship. So it became uh, much more difficult to uh, speak about um, this Semitism, the similarity between Jews and uh, Muslims, and instead they came into conflict. 
Okay, so gradually it's become not so easy to stress Jewish Muslim solidarity. Uh, and the reason it's not easy is the elephant in the room, uh, which is Israel, Palestine. Often we try to avoid that, not to speak about that elephant in the room, but it's very difficult. Uh, so let me just uh, illustrate what I'm saying as an introduction through a little uh, series of images. So what you see here is uh, a, a photograph of a synagogue in a town where I grew up in uh, Slovakia, in Bratislava. It's not there anymore. Uh, when I was growing up, it was not a synagogue, but a TV studio. Uh, but you can see it's quite large. And now you have to have some uh, knowledge of perhaps of Islamic architecture, but I think you, you can see, you would see it, especially if the picture was sharper, that uh, the domes and the towers are inspired by uh, Islamic architecture as are uh, kind of uh, horseshoe entrances, horseshoe uh, shaped vin windows. And I was fascinated by this building. I was not, uh, my parents survived the Holocaust and they taught us not to emphasize that we were Jewish because they were afraid that we would be persecuted. I have to admit, I never encountered any anti Semitism in uh, Slovakia, but could be because I was not emphasizing that I was Jewish, but I was really scared that there were anti-Semites and that they, they were going to attack us. Uh, and so when I saw this building, it just, I can't describe to you what it did to me. Uh, it, I was very excited about it as a teenager. And I did understand that it meant to be a Middle Eastern building. And so uh, I started to develop in myself a similar, I think, feeling of kinship, fantastic kinship to uh, Muslim people in the Middle East. That was in the minds of the community that approved uh, this building. Okay, today seems very odd, you know, perhaps, uh, but at the time, I think it was not odd. Uh, so here I was born in Prague, and those of you who have visited Prague, they may, you may have seen the synagogue, called Spanish, mistakenly called Spanish. I've studied the history of the synagogue, it has absolutely nothing to do with Spain, and it was not built for Sephardim. These kind of synagogues were built for German-speaking Jews, and they were often reformed temples. That's definitely very seldom orthodox uh, synagogues. And you can see the horseshoe windows and the crenellations. They're inspired by Islamic architecture. You can perhaps see that even more here. Uh, this is the uh, synagogue, uh, Jerusalem Street Synagogue in Prague. It belonged to the congregation that Franz Kafka was a, a member of, not a very uh, frequent visitor to the synagogue, but his family belonged to it. And here you see uh, a horseshoe entrance to the uh, Israelite temple of Florence, Italy. These buildings are all over. Uh, this beautiful building some people may have seen in Budapest and uh, the, the dome, the tower. So I know exactly what the architect meant by this because there's a document that describes what he had in mind. And he said, Jews don't have their own architecture. So I'm going to use Arabic architecture as he saw it because the Jews are relatives of the Arabs. And that was uh, the, the person who made the design for this synagogue, which inspired many other buildings in the world. This is uh, the interior of a synagogue in Budapest on uh, Rumbach Street. And uh, now I'll show you in the next picture what this and many of these so-called Moorish style synagogues were inspired by, and that's the Alhambra in Spain. So I also study Islamophobia and other things in Spain. So I can tell you I'm looking forward to the spring when I'll be spending some months in uh, Granada, a beautiful city. Some people may have seen the Alhambra inspired a lot of synagogue architecture in Europe. 
you might think that this is an Eastern European thing. It's not, but you do see it uh, in uh, Eastern European places. Like this is Chernovitz or Chernevtsi, which is today in Ukraine. Uh, this is the famous Oranian Burgerstrasse uh, synagogue restored in uh, Berlin. Uh, and now to America, this Port Gibson, Mississippi, uh, an old synagogue, you see the horseshoe windows there, uh, probably built by German, so-called German Jews, who often came from what's today uh, Czech Republic or from Poland. And uh, that was the case also of the Plum Street Temple in Cincinnati. And if somebody knows better, you can con correct me. But as far as I know, the Plum Street Temple today still has the tallest minarets in the United States. Uh, so this uh, synagogue, the central synagogue in New York was inspired by the Budapest one. <clears throat> and here we can see it's beautiful interior. So I meant by this to show you visually how Jews themselves uh, proudly, some of them, not all of them at all, uh, accepted this so-called kinship with uh, Arabs and thereby Muslims, which is expressed by the architecture of these beautiful places of worship. Uh, but we can look quickly at how Christians in Christian art have depicted Jews and Muslims in similar ways. And most people, to my surprise, don't even question the way that ancient Israelites are depicted in Christian art and how the model for that is, con is contemporary Muslim dress. Okay, so here you see the person who's on our right of Christ. He has a, a head covering with the stripe in the middle of it. Okay, which is very common uh, for depicting Jews during this uh, period, but also depicting Muslims. So here you see uh, another painter of Siena from about the same period showing us how Saint Clare, through prayer, ejected the Muslims, the Saracens, from an Italian city. So the Christians didn't even have to fight because the prayers were enough to get rid of these guys. But look at how you know, the striped head dress, you know, is now on the Saracens, the same one that you see on Jews in biblical times. Later on, it was not the, that headwear, but the, the Turkish turban that became the model in uh, Christian art for depicting Jews and Muslims if they depicted Muslims, but biblical art was so important to Christianity and Rembrandt, it's, it's very common for him to use these turbans. Rembrandt had a collection of exotic objects and he tried to depict through biblical pictures, the Orient, okay? What we mean by the Orient as in Edward Said is principally uh, North Africa and the Middle East. And then uh, by the end of the 19th century, when the Turks lost their power, the Ottomans lost their power. So the model actually for Jews became Arabs and Palestinians. And this is a famous uh, biblical illustration by Gustave Doré. And uh, it's called the Pharisee and the Publican. And uh, to me, that... Uh, uh, Pharisee there is wearing a uh, classic traditional Palestinian uh, dress. And in fact, often the artists actually, not Gustave Doré, but others have actually traveled to the Middle East to observe um, Arab wear. And then they used it both to depict Arabs and uh, biblical Jews. By the way, note that Jesus Christ here in the middle he does not wear Palestinian dress. That's very common. I've only, never seen Christ wear a turban except in Christian art from the Middle East, but not in Western Christian art. Uh, so, and here I am showing you something you can buy on the internet. It's a, a nativity scene used at Christmas. And you can see that uh, Joseph, the husband of Mary, is wearing uh, a kind of headwear, a, a kafiyeh, 
that's very common in the Middle East, also among Palestinians. And now I'd like to end my slideshow with a picture from the early uh, settlement in the early 20th century by Jews in Palestine. And there are many examples of this. I bought this, uh, I shouldn't admit where I got it because I think it may have been <laughs> illegal, but uh, it was in an archive. And, um, and so Jews were dressed in kafiye, like especially this guy here on our left squatting, that's, that's just simply a, a typical Palestinian kafiya. Others invented all kinds of fantastic oriental uh, headwear and dress. Uh, but the point was that, you know, the Jews were uh, an oriental people in that sense, a Semitic people and uh, them settling in Palestine they were not European outsiders. They were uh, people who belonged uh, to that land. So uh, I thought the visuals would help to drive this point uh, home. Uh, as I was saying, uh, Jews and Muslims are all, both of them regarded very similarly and uh, both of them uh, part of uh, a racialized religion. So Jewish-Muslim solidarity, I feel, can be built on this knowledge. I mean, we can use this knowledge strategically that Jews and Muslims have been depicted the same way and, and uh, increase awareness of similarities uh, between us. But unfortunately, no more Moorish style synagogues were built when Jewish settlement in Palestine became prominent. So they were only built until about the 20s. And in fact, also biblical art showing ancient Israelites as, uh, as Muslim Arab Palestinians is not as common as it used to be. And when it exists, it just quotes uh, old models. And what has changed is not only that it's, uh, uncomfortable for us to speak about Israel-Palestine. And it is. I mean, I, I'm going to speak next uh, in a week or two uh, at a meeting that between a synagogue, organized by a synagogue and a mosque in Toronto. And that meeting had been arranged a few months ago, but it was canceled. Uh, it was scheduled right after the Gaza war. And it was canceled because our Muslim friends uh, it was not my synagogue, but the, the Muslim uh, organization, the, the mosque, didn't uh, want to participate because some of the synagogue members went to a rally and uh, one of the slogans in the rally was defend Israel. Okay, so they felt that even to say defend Israel today is already Islamophobic and it's racist. And they don't want to participate with people who can, in a context like a Gaza war, war uh, say, defend Israel. Uh, fortunately, the two groups got together and worked it out. So we are going to have this event. And I will be speaking there with Aziza Kanji, uh, who I sometimes speak about uh, uh, Muslim uh, Jewish things. But it's an illustration that it's very embarrassing, like we, we can talk, but when it comes to the current, it's really hostile events happen, uh, then it's difficult to talk about it. But it's more than that, because against the background of it is uh, the, the geopolitical truth that Israel is an ally of the United States and maybe with some difficulty of Western Europe, and many of the Muslim states are essentially enemies of those same powers, although of course we see exceptions now. So I think we have to realize these tensions between uh, scholarship and uh, geopolitics. Okay? And if we want cooperation, we want to work for peace, we can use the scholarship strategically to fight misunderstanding uh, 
but also, and I, I don't have easy answers to how, uh, we, we can't always ignore the very uh, disturbing reasons, but real reasons, uh, for this accord between Jews and Muslims. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Um, it'll be great to um, to turn to our audience's questions and comments. I, I was thinking, um, because I've got so many of my students here from Jews and popular culture, where we've been talking about how popular culture helps do some of the work to move Americans away from maybe their anti-Semitic views of Jews, especially in the mid 20th century. Some of this, the students who I see on our attendees list have just written papers on sort of the power of the Goldbergs television show, a very popular TV show um, in the mid 20th century, and, and what it must have meant for so many Americans who didn't really know Jews to suddenly have Jews in their living room and see that Jews had family dynamics that were just like their own or at least sort of relatable and sympathetic. And so I'm, I'm wondering sort of from the perspective of that class and these students do, are we seeing popular culture do um, any of that work with Islamophobia or with Muslims today? Um, curious what you think. Yeah, I mean, you know, there, there, I mean, the thing is that the presence of Muslims now, there was, what was that show? It was really, really popular. It was a TV show with a family, um, Something Prairie. Do you remember that? Um, it was a really, really popular show. It was about looking at Muslims. Um, there also, one of the things that when you teach Islam, and I'm sure Ben can speak uh, about this, is that the Hollywood has been just so, um, so in line with depicting Arabs and Muslims as terrorists that it has been very hard to get another narrative across. And not only that, I mean, you know, you talk about um, our recent political um, departure from Afghanistan has brought up this whole idea of the Taliban. So now we're back to thinking of Muslims being the Taliban. It's almost like we don't move really very much over the years. It's been 20 years. Uh, since we went into Afghanistan, I remember the images of uh, women in in the purple, uh, not hijab, but covering burqa is what we call it, or sometimes we call it the shuttlecock because it you know it lets you breathe a little bit. And now again, we're back to that. You know, somehow there's always this like saving or condemning um, idea. So it's very hard to build that narrative. I mean, there are many people that are now comedians, there are people who are out there, people who have won Academy Awards, there are Arabs or Muslims, but most of the time we don't know that they are. That's mm -hmm. the same thing with Jews in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the time we didn't know who, um, who wrote a song or who was depicting uh, somebody. I mean, one of the examples I can give you is, um, I interviewed Robert Clary, who was in Hogan's Heroes, which is way before everyone's time, including mine. Um, and he was a, a the, the French chef in the kitchen. Um, and, and, you know, I told people about this and we had no idea he was a survivor. You know, so there's all these di different ways that people were masking, mm -hmm. trying to do this, what we call assimilation, right? In, in terms of the larger context of popular culture or who we were. So a lot of the identities disappeared. And then when you look at Muslim immigration to America, you know, you can go from African slavery all the way to, you know, the last 10 years, which has been trickling in uh, because of the different quotas that we put on this immigration policies. But, you know, you see a real height of, you know, Lebanese and Syrians coming in like the 30s and then the 40s. And then you see different people. And then you start to look at what was going on in those countries, you know, um, how are they being formed? But it wasn't this huge migration. Um, and I think this is also a very interesting conversation because um, immigration is a big problem all over Europe now in terms of Syria and Muslim immigrants. And we also have that issue here in this country today. Um, and so, you know, um, even when I was in Berlin and I remember when Angela Merkel took in 1.2 million uh, Syrian refugees in Berlin, 
Uh, I was speaking to people there and they were like, well, yeah, I mean, we feel bad for them, but what if they're terrorists? And I was like, wow, you know, like, I know you, you know, it was this uh, complete, you know, very, very honest kind of response. So I think that, you know, there is this kind of stubbornness of accepting Arabs and Muslims in, in the fabric of Europe and America to this day. Um, and it happens to Jews as well, but it's different. And I, and I want to say that, um, Ivan, I, I agree with with the fact that Jews and Muslims were depicted maybe Oriental. But I also want to say that when Jews were in Europe um, and experiencing anti-Semitism and during the Holocaust, uh, the, the thing they had Germans and uh, Romanians and um, most Eastern and Western uh, European Jews would put up posters saying, go to Palestine, go home. So, you know, it was almost like they were already seen that way by Europeans, even though they were European. Does that make sense? So one of the pushes and one of the things that if you look at Holocaust studies and memories of survivors, they will say that, that, that that's where we thought we had to go. We had no idea, but because they were telling us that we're, that's where we belonged. And I think that is an interesting um, way to look at how Jews did go to what is you know Israel today and Palestinian territory. So I think we have to also understand that Jews were supposed to, under the Europeans, go back to what was Palestine. The other thing is this kind of idea of uh, fear of the other is very, very prominent um, in terms of Jews and Muslims in different ways in America, right? Jews are always, you know, the big tropes of Jews are going to control the world. They control our policies. They are, they're full in Congress, um, you know, kind of depicting the Rothschilds, you know, they have all of the money and power. Whereas, whereas Muslims in this country are the ones to fear because they actually can kill you because they have tried, right? And that's the thing that, that, that constantly happens. So there's different ways of looking at these different phobias, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but they're really important to make those distinctions. Um, and to make those distinctions because the United States has always had a very, very uh, problematic geopolitical relationship with the Arab Middle East and South Asia, um, especially Muslim countries. So Maybe our parents remember, you know, the depictions of Iranians in this country in the 1970s. And then boom, you know, you have Iraq. And then you have, you know, the wars that go on up until 2001. Then you have Iraq and Syria. So our generation, our students who are on this call have absolutely no memory of Islam or an Arab or a Muslim state ever being a partner or a friend. Uh, so that is something we need to really think about in terms of, you know, where are we getting these tropes from? Um, you know, related to that, uh, uh, sorry, Ivan, please go ahead. Um, well, I'd just like to comment on what Mena said that, you know, my presentation was about, uh, I tried to focus on Muslim Jewish cooperation. And I think it was very clear in my presentation that not just recently, but for centuries, Western Christians viewed Jews as, and Muslims as being the same. Okay, that, and, and so when Jews built those Moorish synagogues, they didn't invent this idea. I, my suggestion was they bought into it. It was often built by, they were built by Jew, um, Christian architects, right? So... Uh, the role of Christian Zionism, the Christian idea about Jews belonging to Palestine is very important. And I thought I was actually bringing that out in my, okay. my yeah. talk uh, that, you know, they were supposed to be Palestinian. They were supposed to be Orientals, just like you said, man. I was like, that's in the background of both the Morris style synagogue and, and uh, Zionism, very much so to such an extent that some people like Amnon Rastrakotskin in, in Israel would even argue that Zionism was actually a Christian idea. 
Uh, so yeah, that, I, I think that's very important. But I also would like to make a comment on what Rachel said about the media. And there's this very interesting, okay, so several things. Uh, but there is this very interesting book by Melanie McAllister, which was published in the late 90s, which perhaps your, your students are, are looking at, which kind of uh, looked at the media at that time in the late 90s, presenting a multicultural America, but one that excludes only Arabs. So it's like everybody can get together to hate Arabs. And so the films show like black American heroes fighting uh, uh, Muslim and Arab terrorists. It was mainly about the US Army as uh, having this ideal of a miniature world, like every person of every race and ethnicity in America can join the US Army. Colin Powell was then the, uh, the chief of staff, but Muslims were still an enemy. So I, I think it's, it, it, it continues in many ways. Uh, that media depiction of Muslims. There are exceptions, of course, but I think also the way I understood, Rachel, uh, what you said was that there was really, there's decades long development in popular culture, especially Hollywood, to present Jews as uh, normal people who are not so different from Americans. Uh, they were good people. They were not rich, like it was a kind of subtle way to undermine anti-Semitic stereotypes, like Woody Allen, you know, his family living under uh, the ele elevated railway in New York in very poor circumstances. So it's like a lot of effort has been invested to make uh, Jews look American on the screen. And even when they are not American, then maybe make them look like the people of Jesus, you know, that that might go back uh, in cinema to Ben-Hur and, and, and stuff like that. But we never had anything like that in, uh, about Muslims. At least I can't think of anything. You know, there's just not been a, a, a media, popular culture tradition to make Muslims look like normal Americans with a likable ethnic tradition. I, I'm sure there are ex exceptions. I just, I just thought of something really funny, but Dr. Oz is Muslim. <laughs> it's, I don't, I mean, he's Dr. Like, Dr. Oz is, he's Muslim, he's from Turkey. So, I mean, it's, it's funny how you, <laughs> yeah, I, was probably like, yeah. I mean, that would kind of humanize, I think, in a weird audience who Muslims are, because Dr. Oz, you know, he's like, uh, any kind of show, show host uh, that we have in the United States. So that's one way, Rachel, of looking at, you know, like this kind of hidden identity. Um, actually, you know, who really talks about that really well is W.E.B. Du Bois in his book on, you know, um, Souls of Black Folk, where he talks about this double consciousness and he himself being French and African is sometimes mistaken for being French. And they're sitting there talking, you know, openly and racially about him and he's a professor and, you know, he doesn't survive. He just, he goes back uh, uh, to Kenya. But so, I mean, this double consciousness is always at work in America. And I think that's important for popular culture too, right? I mean, there are things that maybe I notice that you or I even noticed that, you know, I may not notice in terms of how we were taking in these images in the social media all the time. I mean, recently, sadly, there was a young girl, uh, uh, Somaya Wat in New Jersey, second uh, grader who's a teacher pulled off her hijab uh, because she wanted to experience her beautiful hair. And it's become a big controversy um, over and over again. So the teacher says, oh, I thought it was a hoodie. So I couldn't see the eyes. Um, and you know, the woman, is, uh, the mother is very, very upset. I mean, so there, there is still the idea that you can actually tell someone how to dress. Um, and so I keep, I said I was an idealist, talk about the United States and how we have actually religious freedom. Whereas in France and in Germany and other places, I would have to take off my hijab, my kippah and my cross and walk into a high school. Uh, whereas here we do have that religious freedom. Not so in think, Germany. Not in not in Germany. Not in Germany. What? You don't have to take it off. No, not at all. Not in France. 
sorry. In France, yes. Yeah. So the, the and it would be in the public sector, but it's also frowned upon in Germany. Um, and there are comments made to people all the time if they're wearing it here. There is this kind of okay, you have to accept it. So what I'm trying to say is that we have a little bit of room here um, that we wouldn't find in in other places. Yeah, I mean, when you mentioned that room here, um, the the idea of religious freedom um, and how sort of helpful that can be, it reminds me in my classes we we often talk about how that religious freedom sort of was how Jews were able to integrate into the mainstream, and it was it was the don't think of us as a race, think of us as a religion. And since we do have this tradition of religious freedom, well then shouldn't, you know, shouldn't we be and can't we be accepted? And, and so in that way, the category of religion has been sort of strategically useful for Jews in America as they sort of worked in the post-war years to say, think of us as a religion. And I, I'm just curious if it's, I almost wonder if, um, Islam has seemed like not a similar enough religion, you know, it, it, has it been as helpful for, um, Muslims to, to describe and conceive of themselves as a religion, or is the majority Christian culture just not as willing to see their religion as, um, legitimate or equal? I mean, I, you know, it's a simple... So I... Go ahead. Yep. Ivan, go ahead. No, if you can. No, I, I don't know why. I, I would, I'll speak after you. Go ahead. No, no, I was just, I mean, I was going to say that, you know, one of the things that uh, makes me <laughs> maybe irritated or kind of frustrated is that, you know, after 9-11, a lot of us Muslims thought that there would be more education about Islam. And we just didn't seem to go there. And there was all these, you know, pundits writing about Islam and terrorism. And people were reading this sort of honestly trashy, you know, kind of historical fiction about, you know, who these terrorists were. Um, but, you know, I still find that when I teach Islam in my classes, I have to start from zero. So you, you spend two weeks deconstructing the tradition before you start talking about really the content of the class. Um, and start to, you know, say, okay, well, you know, Muslims are Africans and Asians, and I mean, very simple things. So I think some of that has to do with the fact that we haven't really educated ourselves with Islam and, um, the relationship that we have with, um, Islam has been very different with the relationship that we've had with Judaism. Um, and certainly, I mean, Islam in Europe is very different because there we have, there's an intimacy between the European and the Muslim in a very different way that you don't find in terms of the United States. Go ahead. So I think that um, <clears throat> the, what also plays a role in addition to what uh, Amena said is that traditionally American Protestantism mm. has uh, a very high respect for the Bible and there is this tradition of thinking that the Jews are the people of the Bible. Uh, and uh, Islam, you know, it's not known to people that Islam is also quite close to Christianity and, and Judaism, because certainly it's not an American tradition to think of Islam in that way. So uh, while I, I think you're extremely right that, uh, Religion, the principle of religious freedom is what allows the potential for Islam to be eventually accepted. Uh, but I think also the reason it's not as easily accepted is because uh, Christians, especially Protestants, don't traditionally think of uh, Islam the way that they think about Judaism as a religion that is uh, akin to Christianity. So this is why I, I mentioned earlier it's important to look at anti-Semitism together with philo-Semitism. Mm. There's a lot of liking for Jews in American Protestant tradition. It would also not be the case that Islamophobia is not coupled with some tra in tradition with some admiration, because that's also not true. So uh, in, in France, 
and England in the 17th century, the Ottoman Empire was often used as an imagined, and Persia too, as an imagined sort of staging ground for imagining utopias about what the West should be like. And, and the many people who studied uh, Arabs and Muslims in Europe uh, were not just necessarily advocating colonial uh, exploitation, but also we're sometimes critical of the West. You know, and, and we're looking, for example, at Islam as a more spiritual religion. Many people in the West, including Orientalist scholars, converted to Islam. Mm -hmm. okay? So it's not that there hasn't been uh, an admiration for Islam, but there's been so much more admiration, if you can call it that, because it's always very complex. Uh, but so much identification of Protestant Christianity with, uh, with Jews, and I think especially in America and in England. So I wonder if we should- it's just another aspect of- Yeah, so thank you. I wonder if we should look to the questions in the, the chat. There was, there's a question from Joseph Levy, which I think is directed to Manaz. And Joseph asks, what is the significance of including or not including a hyphen in anti-Semitism. So Menaz, maybe you could clarify about that point that you made in your opening remarks. Yeah, sure. I think Ivan actually answered it by talking about it's if it's it's with a hyphen, it's really talking about Semites, se uh, Semitic languages, um, which is very different from anti-Semitism. And anti-Semitism was a was a term that was coined by William Marr in 1879, just for a Jew particularly. So there's a there's sort of you know so then you forget the different moments of anti-Semitism if you have the collapsing of those words. It's not really my argument. I was pointing out how some people see anti-Semitic with a hyphen as more powerful to talk about when there was really anti-Semitism and and Judeophobia or anti-Jewish uh, sentiment or um, different types. But anti-Semitism as one word is seen as sort of a block um, and has become problematic for some. I use, like I said, anti-Semitism as one word uh, because I think that if we don't use, and, and, I'm not, and, and at this point I'm talking about talking as a Muslim because I feel that that argument by many scholars like Anil Anjar ha has been more so, okay, well, it's anti-Semitic, so we are Semitic, so how can we be anti-Semitic? It doesn't work for me that way, you know? So I have to, I have to be very clear about, you know, any kind of racism that, you know, just, just co-opting that Semitic word, it doesn't make you um, sort of, uh, you know, justify your anti-Semitism or, an, or Judeophobia. So that's why I keep that word. And I do that especially to make a point as a Muslim, um, because I think that's really, really important that we that we do that for one another, because then you let people use Semit Semitism as a racialized category towards Arabs and Jews. So why let that go even further is my point. I don't know if that makes sense, but it's really about Semitics. Yeah, thank you. So there are some other questions in the chat. There are two very long questions, and I wonder if others are going to write questions, please make them concise. The first long question is from our colleague Patricia Sohn, who writes, relating to Judaism as a multi-ethnic panoply, some people in Israel and the MENA region have described having to lose or publicly deny identities as Arab or Persian Jews as difficult or oppressive for them. Yet those identities might contribute to making such people seem more foreign were they emphasized here in the US. On the other hand, they could contribute to Jewish Muslim coexistence. How do you recommend balancing these different factors and needs for the benefit of all? Yeah, so that's uh, Patricia Sohn from the Department of Political Science mm -hmm. and Jewish Studies. 
Yeah, so I don't know who would like to address that. Um, I mean, I, I can uh, say, yeah, go ahead, Ivan. It's a, it's a lot, it's a complicated question, but go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I, I'm happy for you to go first, I, then I'll say something. Um, I mean, I, I, so, I mean, one of the things, I mean, we're really talking about uh, basically Jews are, are, are asked to sort of not talk about their, their roots or their Judaism um, in a way especially in North Africa or the Middle East. I mean, I'll give you an example. So I was born in Karachi, Pakistan, and um, there haven't been any Jews in Karachi since 2009. Like, I think the last woman died. And there's a cemetery very close to where my, my relatives live, where my mother lives, and it's a Jewish cemetery, um, as, we, as we found out. Uh, but the people who go there and bury their dead are not to be known as Jews. Uh, so they're kind of crypto Jews, right? So there is this kind of disappearance of that identity, yet everyone knows it's a Jewish cemetery. Uh, cemetery. So I don't know. And I think that that in itself becomes a problem and not useful for Jewish Muslim coexistence. Because, you know, if you're asking me about North Africa and the Middle East, it seems that most of these um identities have sort of been effaced um it doesn't mean that moroccan jews can't live in morocco as as i'm sure all of you know there are moroccan jews but you know in egypt like in cairo there's 50 jewish families left so this is a really big big loss i think um in terms of cultural identity and jewishness in north africa and the middle east so i don't know if i answered your question but i'm sure ivan can do better Um, so I'm not sure either if maybe the question was about Israelis who, Israeli Jews who uh, have a Persian background or some other Middle Eastern background from a, a Muslim country. Uh, as, as I understood that question, uh, it may have included also that they're encouraged to deny this connection. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it is a very complex issue, as, as Menas says. Uh, in Israel, roughly half the Jews are of origin from Muslim countries. And to say that they're discouraged from identifying as such, I think would be an oversimplification. Because in elections, uh, for example, it plays a very large role. And as I'm sure many people know, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu used to go around and whisper in the ears of people of uh, origin, they're called Mizrahim, so-called Oriental Jews, used to whisper in their ears that the, those who were against Netanyahu uh, were all Ashkenazim, so they were like European uh, uh, Jews. And uh, it's often been discussed not maybe not often enough, but it's been discussed, including by the person I mentioned before, Amnon Raskrakotskin, an uh, Israeli historian, if uh, Jews, so-called Arab Jews, could be a link to uh, to Muslims and you know a, a force for for peace. And it's a super complicated question, if that was your question, but mm -hmm. if it wasn't, it's worth, worth asking anyway. Uh, the, uh, as, you, as you probably know, uh, many of the Mizrahi, the so-called Oriental Jews, vote as a group for Jewish nationalist parties uh, that seem to be very intolerant of the idea of uh, peace with Muslims, while at the same time culturally identifying with uh, Arabic music. And, you know, if they're from Morocco, they love to travel to Morocco. And if they're from Iran, they think of themselves as Persian. Uh, but at the moment, politically, they don't seem to be a force for peace. But I think you're right if you're suggesting that potentially it may be so, because in the right circumstances, you would think that people who have a cultural affinity with others 
might, you know, if, if there was the right leadership and the right context, uh, they might put that to use to, uh, uh, to make peace. Yeah, thank you. Here's another question from the chat from Nathan Polselli. And Nathan asks, by seeing news uh, reports or even official statements by governments, the relationship between Islam and Judaism can sometimes uh, be seen as irreparable. Are there purposefully contentious narratives getting pushed by sources such as these? If so, what can the average person like me do to push back against them? Yeah, so that's, um, again, dealing with this so, that you find in the media. Can I ask, answer that? Sure. Okay, so I, uh, so there's, uh, there's certain uh, pre scholars that, who have actually followed the money about where Islamophobic uh, literature comes from. You know, Islamophobic uh, social media and, uh, you know, releases and so forth. So I think it's, there is a certain amount of purposefulness and, and they come from, I'm, I'm sad to say, from Christian evangelical sources and, and from some Jewish sources. And uh, so whether that is really the, the, the major source of uh, Islamophobia, I don't know. I, I personally don't have as much uh, belief that the media is omnipotent. But I, I, the question was, if there are purposeful, uh, yes, I mean, they, 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 they certainly are. And, you know, there's literature about it. Look at, you can look it up on the internet in relatively respectable uh, sources and, and, and you will find like charts of who finances what and, and so forth. And I think that the way you can best uh, counteract it is, I mean, there's also alternative media, so make your judgment, but also educate yourself, you know, take courses like maybe you're already taking. Uh, where you will learn about uh, Muslims and Jews being not at all uh, irreconcilable enemies in history or not necessarily in the future. <clears throat> I mean, I'm here, aren't I? Yeah. Did you want to add something to that, Benaz, or? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that, you know, I, you know, my work is all about reconcil uh, reconciliation between Jews and Muslims. And, you know, I have very challenging times during the Israeli Gaza incursion. Um, I am pro-Israeli and pro-Palestinian, and I get beaten in my head for saying that all the time, and sometimes threatened. Uh, but I, I think you have to make a decision. Where do you want to walk in your life? Do you want to walk on the side of I'm right and you're wrong? Um, do you want to think even if the other party is wrong that, you know, that they should not even have a conversation with you. So these are questions that you have to ask yourself morally, uh, very deeply in, in, within yourself, which are very hard questions to ask. And I think once you have answered those questions about, you know, that I, even though, you know, I see Jews and Muslims this way, or they're always fighting, do, what do I really want to see? I want to see peace between the two, right? Or I want to see peace between Israel and Palestine. And I think that is the question that you want to ask yourself because, you know, if you listen to the social media or even some academics uh, and scholars in both my fields in, in, in Judaism and in, in Holocaust and, and in Islam, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to, you know, go on, but you have to make a decision uh, what you want to do morally and what's valued in terms of human life and human thinking. And that's how you, you, you take a risk like, a Muslim woman running a Holocaust center. Um, so that's that's a big risk to take. But you know what? It's been 10 years and and thank God it's been fine. 
Yeah, so thank you. There's another question from the chat from Sharon Brown, who asks the two speakers to suggest some fictional works that can help us to gain understanding of this topic. I like that question. Uh, well, my PhD was actually on Nari Mafuz, but there is there are a lot of um, books, um, and I'm not thinking about it right now. But the one um, book that I really, really loved, um, and it's a very tough book. It's called The Words of My Father by Yusuf Bashir. It's a it's an, a memoir, and he's Palestinian, and his home was um, under the Israeli IDF force for seven years. Um, he ended up getting out because he got shot by an IDF soldier and coming to, I'm telling the whole story now, but you have to read the book. And he, and he went to Brandeis, but his whole point is of peace. So, I mean, that kind of literature really helps in terms of thinking about, you know, people who have actually experienced it, but also uh, actually gone out and studied um, uh, their, you know, uh, uh, someone else's literature, which is what I love to do. And I think that you know, who else can I give you as an example? Um, they're asking for literature, Ivan, if you can suggest someone else like fictional, right? Or fiction or just um, yeah, fictional work to help understand anti Semitism and Islamophobia. Yes, yeah, so Ivan, you're muted. I think I lost him for a sec. I'm trying to think of. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I was off for a while, and now I'm back. So I missed the a little bit of the conversation. I'm sorry. I yeah. have. Um, yeah. Actually, I just taught a book. Just to give one more. Uh, I gave you a um, Palestinian. I'll give you a, a Syrian uh, American woman, Mona Kaf. She wrote the yellow, the orange. Um, scarf um incredible writer as well so there's a lot of muslim american writers that are doing this kind of work um, there's also really great material coming from syria um, and from iran um, the literature is a little tough if you don't have the background to understand the issues that people have in those specific countries um, like iran but um uh, khalif is another person from turkey i do a lot of work with orhan pamuk um, he's incredible. The, the book Snow is really worth reading because it talks about all the different issues within the country, right? Within Islam. It's not just one narrative or two narratives, but all the different uh, levels like Sufism, Islamic fundamentalism, terrorism, um, so secularism, right? Uh, we don't think of secular Muslims, but they're everywhere. Uh, so there's all kinds of ways that you can look at this literature. Okay, thanks. Ivan, are there any works of literature you would like to recommend? Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm afraid that per, I, I may have missed the question, but it's probably about a literature that makes you understand the relationship between Muslims and Jews. Yeah, or anti Is that what we're... Or anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. Um, I'm more, uh, um, well, there is academic literature on it, but uh, so there is a, a book uh, edited by uh, James Renton and Ben Gidley called Anti-Semitism and Islamophobia. And uh, I have written on this myself, uh, including, <laughs> I don't know if I should, mentioned the now discredit, largely discredited uh, author Tariq Ramadan, uh, who uh, unfortunately uh, has been accused of sexual harassment and uh, the, the case is still pending. Uh, but Ramadan's writing is very, um, sometimes very beautiful kind of inspirational writing and he, uh, often includes uh, Muslims and, and Jews. Uh, I know that Orhan Pamuk does, Menas mentioned him. I don't know if people mentioned Salman Rushdie, but uh, he also uh, sp uh, writes about uh, Jews in, in, in India. But in fiction, I, I'm afraid I, I don't have something that's right on. Yeah, 
Okay, thank you. So there's another question from the chat from our colleague Ali Mia, who was a professor of Islamic studies, and he writes, it seems that the division between religion, culture, and politics shift greatly between reparative projects that seek reconciliation by appealing to a shared past and political critiques that call out Israeli state violence or Hamas or Islamic Jihad. Does this strategy rely upon a rosy picture of the past in your perspectives? Yeah, so I don't know who would like to go first, um, but I think this is a provocative question. Um, uh, well, what if the past was rosier and uh, I mean, uh, Brian Klug in, in, uh, in Britain has looked at anti-Semitism and Islamophobia in terms of what's the, what is our strategy? Like why are we to talk about it? Uh, if we, especially if we talk about it in a way that makes them related. Okay. So, uh, there are different strategies. Like one could be to paint a rosy picture so that we don't have to talk about the current difficulties in Israel-Palestine, which may be what you're, you're suggesting. And I wouldn't deny that that's a possible uh, strategy. But other strategies are to point out uh, that Jews and Muslims don't always have to fight, so it's just a kind of uh, strategy of building understandings. I think it's worked uh, very well in many places. There are Jewish Muslim groups, and they, I, I mentioned earlier, a breakdown in communications between a mosque and synagogue in Toronto, but they reconnected. And I can't but think that that has political consequences too. I mean, I'm a Canadian, Canada's not a great power, but in America, there are groups like that too. And I, I, I think America does have an influence in the Middle East. So it's very important for uh, Jews and Muslims to understand each other. And uh, another uh, possible strategy is uh, to point out what happened to uh, the, the similarities between what's happening to Muslims today between that and what happened to Jews before World War II. It's not the same, but uh, most people are not, of course, supportive of the Holocaust. And I'm, I'm sure Menas has more to say about this. And uh, some people are offended by comparing anything to the Holocaust, but if you sensitively compare uh, Islamophobia as a potential disaster, uh, it may be a good way to convince people to, to be more open to Muslims. But there's no, I, there's no question about it that the uh, situation in Israel and Palestine doesn't fit well with uh, Jewish Muslim co cooperation in any way, uh, including uh, looking at the common history that Islamophobia and anti Semitism have. Yeah, I, I just want to say one thing. I mean, I think that um, I, I like the question because I think that you're right that there is this kind of romantic, romanticism and nostalgia about the past that Jews and Muslims, some Jews and Muslims, like to have. Um, about the COVID senior and about looking at, you know, how um, Muslims were, were better than, you know, the Christian empire as to Jews. And um, I mean, the great thing was we did translate a lot of really good material together in the past in the 12th, 13th century. So I'm gonna give you that. But I, I mean, I think that the Palestinian Israeli uh, issue is, you know, really acknowledging for Jews and um, to understand how, Israel is seen as a colonial state. Um, and for Muslims to recognize uh, that Jews also have, I mean, it's a very basic thing, have the right to have a state. 
and to sort of talk about Palestinian self-determination and human rights in a way where um, Muslims, Arabs, and others are not always feeling like, you know, well, if we say anything about Israel or critique it, that it will become anti-Semitic. Um, I'm very critical of Israel, but I also believe in the state of Israel. And I think most of my Jewish friends are, and most of my Jewish colleagues are. So it's a way in which uh, I think that you talk to one another and you have to really suck it up. And I mean that emotionally, and you have to acknowledge the suffering of each other in order to have this conversation. Um, but, but I think that to, to avoid the fact that there are these commonalities uh, theologically between our mm -hmm. people that I really, really, really love, um, and I feel very comfortable in a synagogue, and I know that my Jewish friends within the mosque is also, you know, it's, that's also denying someone's reality, right? So when you deny someone's suffering or reality or their faith, um, then you can't have that dialogue. I agree with you, whoever asked that question, if you just have this nostalgia or paint this rosy picture. But I think you have to be really tough and you have to give up something in yourself to have this conversation. Um, because you care about your communities, right? You care about uh, what happens to these communities. And when there's bombs, you know, um, falling on Gaza, it's not easy to have this conversation and vice versa. So I think we have to also recognize who has power, how, and this is why the colonial colonization and the Holocaust piece in my work is so important to me, because I ask I ask people to just stop and freeze for a moment and totally different moments for two peoples at the same time, which is Arabs receiving the, 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 the population of Jews into what was Palestine, this is before 1948, have this kind of moment where they see the, the, the Jews are coming to settle as the colonizer. It's a perception. I'm not saying that's true. We have to stop there and sort of like see that if we, if we are talking about, you know, Oriental Jews and we're talking about colonization and Jews have been colonized, then we have to also stop at moments and change that around. And then we have to, as Muslim and Arabs, look at what happened to Jews during the Holocaust and starting with anti-Semitism and the persecution, starting with pogroms to ghettos to to the Holocaust, these two moments, these narratives are completely lost on both of us. And they have to be sort of talked about in a way. And it's a very uncomfortable moment when you stop there. But history is multi-dimensional. It's not just one narrative. We are all right now experiencing different narratives as we're talking to one another. But if we were to stop each other and say, okay, this is what I'm thinking, Ivan and Rachel and Ben, Right, and stop thinking what you're thinking and then turn it around on me. And I think that moment is both, it's an intellectual moment, historical moment, but it's the moment where we fail to recognize the perception of each other at that moment. Um, and that's where I think we fail in so many ways, because I think, I think, and I hope is that, you know, um, that moment of looking at Israel as a colonial state, as the European colonizer, not a Jew, was a constant, constant feed and the perception. If you talk about David Matadil's book and you look at the propaganda in the Arab world, or if you look at the book that I'm reading right now, Dear Palestine Letters, you see the two narratives, the modern narratives of each other, uh, which are very accusatory. And I don't think we move much from there. And this is something I think is super important and has can transform people in terms of how they think about history and that one very moment. I'm not passionate about this, of course. Yeah, thank you very much, Menaz. And to Ivan, now I don't know, Rachel, if we're running out of time, do we need to wrap things up? And if so, I will turn the floor over to Rachel, who may want to say some concluding, make some concluding remarks. Um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm sorry that we didn't get to all of the, the questions here. Um, one thing that did come up in a class recently was, I was asked, um, did Islamophobia begin 
after 9-11. And of course it didn't, but I, I do not recall the, I, I think the question maybe was more, did the public conversation about Islamophobia not begin until then, or where was it before then? I mean, this is a, an example of our having a conversation before, uh, I mean, uh, at the, uh, currently. Um, and so I'm, I, I guess we've, we've talked about how, how recognizing anti-Semitism, um, talking about it has been part of the American Jewish experience actually for sort of a century now, uh, more than that, but um, it, it probably really entered the American mainstream in the mid 20th century. I'm, I'm curious in our closing here, if you could clarify for us, did we just start talking about Islamophobia in, in sort of the lifetime of our undergraduates um, or, or was this conversation happening before um, and, and we just weren't, aren't aware of it? Um, that's, um, Rachel, you're asking if there's been talk about anti-Semitism and Islamophobia before? Um, I guess I was thinking specifically about the Islamophobia part, just because it's not even, it's a term that I think a lot of um, my students and, and probably many of us associate with post 9-11. So does it have a, a longer history? Um, yeah, the, I mean, the term was coined in 1997 uh, by, by the Rani um, uh Consortium. And, and, you know, it was... The term is... Yeah, I mean, that's how it was termed in terms of culture. Right. Um, Rani Mead Foundation defined it. Yes. And that's how they defined it. Um, but in but there's been a, a talk about... I think we lost you, Ivan. There's been, a, yeah. I mean, Orientalism. I, I, I'm sorry, my connection is so bad that I don't know if I'm jumping in. We can hear you, Ivan. I, I might be interrupting people. I'm so embarrassed. I'm sorry, the connection is terrible, but uh so yeah islamophobia is a very recent term and uh it's very controversial especially in europe uh and in europe it's uh, the, the people who are against it they feel that it's a politically correct term that doesn't allow you to criticize muslims which of course it's not at all that you know but although that term may be new but uh talking about uh, negative images of Muslims. Uh, now, it's a good question. I mean, I, I don't know what uh, the rest of you think about it, but Said in Orientalism was really not talking about Islam, uh, but was focusing on, on Arabs. So arguably it wasn't about what we now call Islamophobia. So yeah, I, I mean, it's a good question, but talking about how Jews and Arabs have been depicted in similar ways, that I think has been around for a very long time and goes back to the 19th century. Yeah, could I, I could add something. I mean, in 1981, Saeed published another book called Covering Islam. Yes, yes. How the media yes. talks about Islam and much of it related to sort of the geopolitical changes after the Iranian revolution in which Islam and Muslims were demonized. So yeah, it definitely has a longer genealogy but it was completely amplified uh, after 9-11. Right, and Saeed's work, make it, I guess in that era, the last decades of the 20th century, it still seems like an more of an academic conversation. Um, and I, I, that's my perception, you might correct me, but um, yeah. and so we might say Islamophobia existed before, but it 
it sounds like the experience that Muslims might have had in in America that they spoke about with their friends and family, but the conversation hadn't gone public um, in the way that we've seen it. Um, Minaz, were you going to say something? Well, I mean, there is a history of of you know earlier we're talking about the Protestant Christians, but you know when we talk about you know early Muslim immigration to the United States, there was a history because there were African Muslims to instantly either convert or to hide the fact that there were Muslims, um, to just to, you know, kind of, you know, assimilate. But then there's also the history of um, African slaves and, and Muslims kind of resisting the idea of slavery and talking about egalitarianism, which is very, very weird for, for the Christians here. So there's all kinds of ways of talking about Islamophobia in the United States. I think the question I thought was talking about Islamophobia as a term that came up mm -hmm. later yeah. on. Because I remember teaching as a graduate student up in Hamilton, uh, a class on Islam. And my God, it was one one kid in my class was from Iran and the rest were um, were, were either Christian or secular or Jewish. And, and it was very Islamophobic. Uh, and this is before 9-11. So I think it's always been there. Um, and I think that yes, 9-11 definitely exasperated it as Ben said. But it's actually it's coming, you know, it's it's coming back now, which which is very fearful um, because of again Afghanistan and the way we're depicting human rights in the world. Um, you know, sometimes as a woman or a Muslim woman, or even my my daughter, she's scared to say she's Muslim in her school because she feels like she just started high school and if she says it, that people won't befriend her. I mean, that's that's not where I wanted to live, you know? I mean, so, uh, I mean, I know in Europe, it can be worse because I was raised there. So for, for me, I think the, the fear or the idea of Islam is very different. Um, you know, that the whole misconception of Sharia and uh, women's hijab and, you know, who ch choices we make has, has not been amplified. And obviously politicians are not, not doing a good job about that. Yeah, the, the conversation makes me think uh, of several things. Hostility to Muslims is very old. I mean, it, you know, we can speak about Martin Luther, but we can also go back to, all the way to the eighth century in Spain. I mean, there's a whole genre of defaming the prophet Muhammad. And there's nothing new about Islamophobia, but it did become intensified in America for sure after 9-11 and perhaps after the Iran hostage, uh, probably Iran hostage uh, crisis. And when it was named as Islamophobia, which I'm not sure, man, as if it was invented by the Iranian in trust, I think they just defined it when they may, it may already have been used. I, I, I don't know, but in our context, what I think is interesting is that that conversation that led to the invention of the term Islamophobia did have something to do with anti-Semitism. It was very common at that time to say that Islamophobia is the new anti-Semitism. Mm. And, uh, and uh, even strategies of fighting against it were compared to what the Jews had done. Like, why can we also not do that uh, for, uh, Islam and in fact many Muslims were using these uh, comparisons to uh, Jewish emancipation and how it had been achieved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's another connection between Islamophobia and anti-Semitism. I'd like to mention one another one which nobody has asked about if I, if I may. Uh, but so it's we find now that Islamophobia, leads to anti-Semitism. Okay. So when you have uh, groups that spread Islamophobia, they very often also spread anti-Semitism. I don't, don't want to cover up the fact that some of the Islamophobic groups are actually Israel-friendly uh, evangelicals and Jews, but there are others who are very anti-Jewish. And uh, I mean, I, my research is in Europe, but uh, I, at least one colleague has found that uh, when Islamophobic groups get together, they hand out anti-Semitic literature. So the increase that we see in anti-Semitism today 
in uh, the, the West, in America and in Europe, is uh, arguably actually connected to Islamophobia. It's, it's a, a spillover from Islamophobia. They're not disconnected. Well, thank you um, both. Um, obviously, there's a lot more to discuss, but it was great to have you with us today. Uh, and thank you to our audience, um, who, many of whom stayed pretty late with us. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you for having us.